Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm David Glazer, and I'm just here to get this started. Um, I do have a quick announcement to begin here. Our webinar is oversubscribed, and we're looking for four volunteers to step off the webinar. We'll be offering you $400 <laughs> to do that. Um, okay, folks at United Airlines notwithstanding, uh, welcome to our webinar about privacy and security. Uh, two of my colleagues will be running the show here. I've got um, uh, Briar and Marguerite are here, Briar Andreessen and Marguerite Amon. Um, both of them do a lot of work in privacy and security, but that is not their only world. And in fact, Briar, I think, was part of what may be the best webinar we ever did back, I think, when I say April, it was a year ago, in uh, on provider-based billing. I know it's probably the one I learned the most from, where she and Katie Hilton and Steve Beck um, did a talk about provider-based billing. And if you are in provider-based soup, Briar and Katie will do a good job of, of fixing that stew. Uh, our past webinars are all available for free, or at least the last 20 years of them, with the exception of last month where we had a little recording glitch. But generally, our past webinars are available on the website. You can get those. Um, the only other announcement, if you want to ask a question, go to the bottom of the page, hover, uh, and you should get the Q&A tab to pop up, and you can type your question there. Briar and Margie will be answering those questions uh, at the end or possibly even in the middle of the talk. And then finally, our, if, if the sound goes to heck in a handbasket, you can always dial in that option exists uh, and that number is showing up in the chat box right now. Oh, last announcement, our next webinar on May 10th, same time Wednesday, May 10th, will be about physician compensation. I'll be doing that and talking about issues that both clinics and health systems have to deal with. Uh, ranging from stark, what can you give credit for in a compensation system, you know, in a health system context, what fair market value analysis do you have to work on, and in particular, ways in which fair market value analysis can lead you astray, common mistakes. So that'll be on May 10th. So without further ado, uh, I turn it over to uh, Marguerite, who's going to start us off, and then Briar. All right, so today's webinar we're going to cover, um, it looks like just a small number of things, but I promise we will take up the full hour. Um, we're first going to start with uh, the latest regulations uh, put out by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, referred to as SAMHSA. Uh, they revised their Part 2 regulations governing confidentiality of substance use disorder treatment programs. Uh, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Breyer, who's going to cover a smattering of different uh, privacy developments. All right, so um, jumping right in. I'm gonna cover just a little bit of background uh, about the part two regulations before um, going into the substantive changes uh, in the new rule. So the privacy provisions in 42 CFR part two, uh, often referred to as just part two, uh, were originally motivi motivated by the idea that there's um, a stigma and fear of prosecution that might prevent some people with substance use disorders from actually seeking out treatment. Um, so some of the significant harms that can be associated with public disclosure of substance abuse um, it are loss of employment, loss of housing, loss of child custody, discrimination by medical professionals, arrest, prosecution, um, and incarceration. So the purposes of the regulations were really to ensure that a patient receiving treatment for substance use disorders um, were not uh, at a were not somehow more vulnerable by reason um, of the availability of their patient records than an individual who chose not to seek out treatment. So these regulations add an extra layer of protection, um, and they outline the limited circumstances um, under which a patient's substance uh, use disorder treatment uh, information can be disclosed with or without the patient's consent. They were first enacted uh, back in the 1970s, and they really haven't been uh, modified in, since 1987, so almost 30 years. Um, the applicability of Part 2 can be a little confusing for certain types of programs, or sorry, certain types of providers, but it generally applies to federally assisted substance use disorder treatment programs, um, which are called Part 2 programs. Um, 
I will get into what a part two program is in a little bit, but I just first wanted to clarify what federally assisted means uh, because that can be also confusing. And under part two, uh, it, they use an incredibly broad uh, definition. So this includes any federal funding, even if it's not for um, alcohol and drug abuse services. It includes tax exemption, um, obviously the receipt of Medicare or Medicaid funds, and even registration with the DEA to dispense controlled substances for treatment purposes. Um, so that is a pretty broad uh, list of federal assistance that could um, bring you under these regulations. So this slide is um, kind of an oversimplification, but part two uh, is de designed to protect any patient identifying information or PII that's held by or has been obtained by um, or obtained from a part two program that could somehow indicate that the individual has a substance use disorder. So in layman's terms, um, it's any information that identifies an individual directly or indirectly as having a current or past drug or alcohol problem or has been a participant in some sort of treatment program. So given that the last uh, major modification to the rule was in the 1980s, uh, it's no surprise that some modernization was needed. Uh, so the revisions to part two are geared towards addressing those changes that have happened in the past 30 years, including the adoption of health information technology, um, the introduction of health information exchanges, and new models of care that really rely on information sharing to coordinate patient care. The new rule uh, was designed by SAMHSA with the stated goals of both modernizing and facilitating information exchange, but also retaining enhancing, and enhancing the privacy protections for patients in these programs. The effective date was originally set as um, February 17th, uh, but as a result of the presidential directive and regulatory freeze, uh, the regulations uh, didn't become effective until March 21st. So moving on to some of the key changes, uh, the final rule revised in some uh, way or another uh, almost all of the definitions applicable to part two, um, leaving only a handful of definitions uh, untouched. So the applicability of the final rule, though, is still restricted, restricted by this definition of program. And SAMHSA did not finalize a proposal that would have added the term general medical practice um, as a result of the substantial confusion that that addition um, created. So it, it still boils down to three different types of programs. The first um, category up there covers the traditional programs, so an individual or entity who holds itself out as providing and provides substance use disorder diagnosis, treatment, or referral for treatment. Uh, the second category is to cover uh, units within a general medical facility that hold itself out in that same way. And then the third category is for um, medical personnel um, or staff in a general medical facility whose primary function is the provision of substance use disorder diagnosis, treatment, referral um, for treatment. Uh, and so uh, two of these use that term hold itself out. And that uh, has not. Uh, been subject to any further clarity by nature of this final rule, but it's still subject to the um, guidance that Sam said promulgated before um, regarding what it means to hold itself, what it means for you to hold yourself out as one of these programs. So you can do that by state licensing procedures, um, by your advertising or posting notices in your office, um, by being listed in registries or having some sort of internet statement to that effect. Um, so there are any number of way that you, ways that you might hold yourself out as one of these programs. Another major change uh, was in updating just core terminology throughout the rule. Uh, of note, uh, the entire set of regulations was actually renamed. So it is now the uh, confidentiality of substance use disorder patient records. And any terminal terminology regarding alcohol and drug abuse has been swapped out with substance use disorder. So I've um, put the definition up there on the screen, um, but it's intended to encompass uh, substance use disorders uh, that can be associated with any kind of altered mental state that is the potential to leading to risky or socially prohibited behaviors. 
Um, so substances such as alcohol, um, opioids, cannabis, uh, and other stimulants. So SAMHSA modified the consent requirements that are found in 42 CFR 2.31 in order to allow for general disclosures to intermediaries, like a health information exchange. So as a basic premise, Part 2 programs are required to obtain written consent in order to share Part 2 information for um, most purposes. And unlike HIPAA, this includes uh, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. The consent requirement of the old regulations uh, required that a consent form include the name or title of the individual um, or the name of the organization to which the disclosure was being made um, as part of the written consent. SAMHSA in this final rule was responding to uh, stakeholder feedback that this requirement to list the name um, was inhibiting or part two organizations from participating in the exchange of um, health information and coordinated care entities, so ACOs and um, health information exchanges. The final rule revises the to whom requirement under the consent provision to allow for a consent to be executed to an intermediary. So again, they're envisioning this health information exchange. Uh, and the consent form could designate the health information exchange who doesn't have a treating provider relationship, um, but then also provide the general designation of something, for instance, my treating providers um, as the class of individuals or entities that the intermediary could then disclose to. But there's one um, significant and large barrier to actually using this form of consent, and that is the additional obligation imposed not on the part two program, but on the intermediary to be able to track and generate a list of disclosures upon a request from the patient. So the disclosures need to go back um, and account for the past two years. Um, and again, that accounting of disclosures will be more um, robust or broader than that, than the accounting of disclosures under HIPAA. So sorry, it's a list of disclosures under part two and accounting of disclosures under, under HIPAA. Um, and so the, the, the big hiccup here is that this consent form that would grant access to intermediaries um, and disclose under a general designation can only be used if and when that intermediary um, is actually prepared and has the capabilities to provide this list of disclosure. Um, and quite understandably, this has been viewed as a very, fairly substantial compliance burden uh, that, that limits the benefit of this um, broadening of the to whom uh, requirement. And um, finally, in response to some comments regarding the fees that could be charged for such lists, uh, SAMHSA indicated that it strongly encourages um, Part 2 programs and intermediaries not to charge patients, but that is not an explicit requirement. SAMHSA had also proposed uh, enhancing the from whom aspect of the consent disclosure in order to balance the added flexibility that it was giving in the to whom section. And it would have imposed a new duty to specifically identify the party disclosing the substance use disorder information. Um, based on pushback uh, from commenters, SAMHSA chose not to adopt this, uh, which um, most people are seeing is at least maximizing the benefit of that general designation. Um, for those who choose and also have the capability of, of using that um, general designation. Also not on the slide, but I did want to point out that uh, the uh, new, the final rule did explicitly permit electronic signatures for these consent forms to, to the extent that they are not prohibited by any um, applicable uh, state or federal law. All right, so part two is historically prohibited redisclosure um, in cases where there isn't a consent or some sort of regulatory exception. The final rule clarifies that the redisclosure prohibition only applies to data that is directly or indirect, sorry, data that in, indirectly or directly identifies a patient as suffering from a substance use disorder. So there's some debate over whether this distinction is actually a meaningful one. Um, 
but when you're looking at whether or not the redisclosure rule applies, you should look to the context and the information that could be deduced from the information just to, that's disclosed and not the data itself, not just the fact that it was information from a Part 2 program. Uh, many people have noted that this distinction uh, on redisclosure is also going to be very hard to apply operationally uh, in a health information exchange. Under the um, old 1987 rule, uh, information could only have been disclosed without consent in, in medical emergencies um, for the purpose of treating a condition which poses an immediate threat to the health of any individual and which requires immediate med medical intervention. Uh, in the final rule, SAMHSA relaxed this and aligned the language under the regulation with the language of the statute, which provides um, providers with a lot more discretion in determining when a bona fide medical emergency exists. Uh, SAMHSA received quite a few comments requesting examples, and they've noted um, that they will be providing um, such examples in sub-regulatory guidance, uh, which we can expect soon, um, but I'm not sure what their definition of soon really is. <laughs> All right, moving on to qualified service organizations. So these are individuals or entities that provide a service to the Part 2 program um, consistent with a qualified service organization agreement. Uh, this can be um, this is comparable to a business associate agreement under HIPAA, and it's a two-way agreement between the Part 2 program and the individual or entity providing the desired service. Uh, and so there are, uh, there's a regulatory definition of a QSO uh, and the services that can be, examples of services that could be provided by a QSO and then allow for disclosures um, for the purposes of, of those uh, services. So they revised the term uh, medical services, which is listed in the examples of um, permissible services offered by a QSO to clarify that it's limited to medical staffing services. Um, and this is to avoid any confusion that QSOs could be used to avoid um, obtaining patient consent in um, true treatment relationships. So a QSO, um, could, so an agreement could be used by a QSO uh, by a part two program to contract with a provider of on-call coverage services um, or me other medical staffing services, but it couldn't be used to disclose a patient's identifying information uh, to their primary care provider or to another provider who's not providing services specifically for the part two program. Uh, likewise, um, Care coordination was not uh, was discussed and not added to the list of examples um, because there's a patient treatment component along with medication management, uh, but they did add population health management as a permissible service of a QSO. Uh, there were some substan substantial changes to the research exception at 2.52, um, a full uh, analysis of these changes is outside the scope of this webinar, um, but it now allows disclosures for research purposes um, so long as the researcher provides documentation meeting certain requirements related to other existing protections for human research. So those protections are under HIPAA and the common rule. Um, and uh, it prohibits any redisclosure except back to the source. Uh, and then also incorporates the, the new um, security provisions uh, found at 2.16 uh, in terms of um, maintaining and destroying the information per the security rule. All right, one place where modernization was certainly necessary was in the section regarding disposition of records by discontinued programs. And uh, this section really only contemplated paper records so you had to take your paper records, put them in envelopes, marked as such, and then secure them in a, in a certain fashion. And now these um, provisions have been updated to address both paper and electronic records. And then it, um, again, cross-references some of the new security um, standards in 2.16.
All right, so it's no surprise that uh, commenters were uh, looking and constantly asking in their questions for, uh, for greater alignment with HIPAA. Uh, and in most circumstances throughout the final rule, they, they failed to, to get that alignment that they would have liked. Um, there are certain areas where SAMHSA acknowledged that it, it tried um, to align with HIPAA and those specific spots are in the definition of patient identifying information or PII um, and the security for records. But SAMHSA has um, remained consistent and clear that part two is intended to be more stringent than HIPAA and therefore that kind of um, harmonious relationship between the two can't, um, can't exist. So for the definition of uh, patient identifying information, um, again, SAMHSA attempted to align, uh, and most notably, this was um, by referencing all of the identifiers that are listed in the HIPAA privacy rule as PHI, um, also fall under the definition of PII, um, but PII is a little broader because it can also include um, any information that could identify the, the patient as suffering from or receiving treatment for a substance use disorder. Uh, the other area that it, it sought to align with HIPAA is security for records in 2.16. Um, so this rule clarifies that both Part 2 programs and also other lawful holders of patient identifying information, so those uh, individuals or entities who have received the information um, by way of a consent or other authorization under law, also have to have these formal um, policies and procedures addressing uh, physical and electronic security for both paper and electronic records, um, including procedures for the destruction of records and the sanitation of, of associated media. So this is not an exhaustive list on this slide, but the policies have to cover um, transferring, removing, and destroying uh, paper and electronic records, rendering the PII non-identifiable, um, creating, receiving, maintaining, and transmitting electronic records, and some physical security measures. So a lot of this terminology um, may seem very uh, uh, similar to, to what we all know uh, under HIPAA. All right, and finally, uh, SAMHSA couldn't cover it all in this final rule. There were a lot of um, issues raised in the uh, comments uh, that that weren't addressed, so they issued a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking, um, and uh, noting that the comments um, highlighted varying interpretations of, of the rules restrictions on lawful holders and their contractors and subcontractors use um, and disclosure of PII um, for purposes specifically of carrying out payments, healthcare operations, and other healthcare related activities. Um, so they're seeking some input and then um, trying to clarify that in another um, potential rule. Um, so the comments for the supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking were due, I believe, uh, in early February, um, and we're still waiting to um, hear back from SAMHSA on those. Are we expecting another 30-year delay? I, you know, I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and now, Briar, on to you. All right. Thank you very much, Marguerite. And um, so that, I think that the part two stuff is uh, a major thing all to itself. And my section here is going to be, as Margie said before, more of a smattering of um, stuff that has come out from OCR and various other government entities about the, the new world of privacy. The question I think that we hear most often on the privacy side, um, privacy and security side is, are we doing enough? Um, and the answer is probably not. No matter how much you're doing, it's probably not uh, enough. Uh, as, a, as the HIPAA audit results and settlements with OCR have demonstrated, it's really hard to do enough. And particularly if you're unlucky enough to have a major breach, um, that means that there was something that you could have done um, in theory, that you didn't do. So it's it's very difficult to do enough. Um, there are, of course, new hacking reports across multiple industries all the time. It's really hard to keep up with the changing environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the upshot is really 
to do your best and pay attention to what is out there as far as guidance and um, enforcement and, and new things in the hacking world. And don't bury your head in the sand about it. Really try to uh, be aware of what is out there. And then if something does go wrong, which it inevitably will, uh, you're better off in general if you can show that you put some effort into trying to make sure that uh, that things didn't go bad. So in the last 12 or so months, there have been a number of um, a number of things issued by OCR or other government entities, not just related to HIPAA, but these uh, the ones listed here are uh, have some relation to HIPAA. Um, and so we'll cover all of the issuance of, of the guidance above. Um, they continue to publish guidance regularly. They try to be helpful. Um, some of the guidance is a lot more helpful than others, but it's good to pay attention to all of it. Um, the first one is HIPAA and the cloud, which is this here is a mock-up of what I imagine my future poorly received children's book would be about, where a hippo has his medical information accidentally disclosed. But also, we have HIPAA and the cloud as a thing, a bit of guidance from OCR. It was uh, aimed at users of cloud computing, both covered entities and business associates. Um, in their guidance, OCR recommended checking the NIST resources, especially the NIST definition of cloud computing, uh, to review our, your options for uh, cloud service providers, or CSPs. Um, in general, what, what they were talking about with this guidance was the online access to shared computing services um, that could have varying levels of functionality depending on uh, how you're using them. It could just be data storage, it could be complete software solutions for an EMR, it could be just about anything. Um, what, among the things that they recommended was to have a business associate agreement with your cloud service provider. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and understand how how the service is going to work so that you can properly do your risk analysis. Um, they also say to pay attention to the service level agreement, or SLA, and that is something as a lawyer that I would recommend to you too, is to really pay attention to what your vendor is saying in that document. Um, we'll talk more about EHR contracts, but the, even those, uh, those agreements are horrible to read and extremely boring and can be very technical. Um, but you really do want to pay attention to what they say they're going to do uh, so that you can make sure that you're getting what you need. Um, and especially with the smaller cloud providers, make sure that they understand the healthcare environment and what you need from them. Um, the, the cloud service provider is going to be a business associate, even if that vendor doesn't have access to the EPHI that it maintains. Um, this is a fight sometimes with the vendors, and I think Marguerite just had a case where a vendor was trying really, really hard not to be a business associate, but they really clearly were. So that is a fight that is worth it to have, um, and if they really are pushing back, that may be an indication that they don't really get it, and they haven't worked in the healthcare sphere very much, um, and they should maybe, you should do a little more due diligence on them. So. Even if what the vendor has is only encrypted information and they don't have a decryption key, um, they are still going to be considered a business associate because they maintain the EPHI in that, with that cloud service. Um, what OCR calls no view services, which is just that, the encrypted information that they don't get to see, um, they have lowered risk, uh, but there is still some risk and the cloud service provider isn't exempt from HIPAA's requirements. So in either the business associate agreement or the SLA or other parts of the agreement with the vendor, spell out who's responsible for what. Um, if, if the business associate says, no, you guys have to do that, you have to be responsible for that, that's okay as long as you're aware of it and can do it. Um, OCR also notes in their guidance that the cloud service provider is not responsible for the compliance failures attributable to um, the actions or inactions of the customer, which would be the covered entity, uh, as determined by the facts and circumstances of a particular case. So don't expect that uh, even though a business associate is responsible and has its own HIPAA obligations, don't expect to get off the hook if, uh, if your business associate agreement or other document says that something is your responsibility to do. Um, using a cloud service provider without having a business associate agreement in place before they get information, that is itself a HIPAA violation. And there was a relatively recent 
$2.7 million settlement uh, based on a cloud-based server without a business associate agreement. So it's a serious issue, so pay attention to that and make sure that those agreements are in place before information goes uh, out into the cloud. Uh, also note that security incidents have to be reported by the cloud service provider. That is a provision in the business associate agreement. Um, the HIPAA regulations do say that a security incident includes attempted or successful uh, unauthorized access. So pings on a firewall would count as an attempted, un un an attempted unauthorized access. And when that happens, that is a security incident and it does have to get reported to the covered entity. Um, there is not a specific requirement about when these reports must happen or how much detail the report has to have. And so the reports can go in various ways. And sometimes when a business associate pushes back, uh, we can change the language of the agreement to say that the business associate agreement itself serves as notice that there are constantly unsuccessful security incidents. So that's okay to have that language in there, um, but make sure that the business associate is reporting those successful security incidents to you. Um, the guidance also says that mobile device use is okay to access EPHI in the cloud. Um, it says that storing information outside the US is okay, um, but if information is going to be sent somewhere outside of the United States, be aware of that and be cautious about it um, and make sure that that is part of your risk analysis. Um, and that goes for both covered entities and the cloud service providers is you need to make sure of what's happening with that information once it leaves the US. Um, the guidance also says that you are not required as a covered entity to audit anybody, um, but you should do some due diligence, particularly if they're going to have access to a lot of information. Um, we see a lot of data security questionnaires and other uh, methods beyond going to visit uh, a provider a vendor that will describe how they control their security environment and so on. And that's generally a very good idea, even if it's not required. Um, OCR also issued a frequently asked question about blocking access to PHI. And uh, the question was, can a business associate block or terminate access to PHI? And the answer is a very clear no. Uh, the business associate is not allowed to use PHI in a way that would violate the security rule, which holding hostage would. Um, they're also required by the security rule to ensure the availability of all EPHI, and they have to make available to the covered entity any PHI necessary to satisfy the covered entity's obligations. So this FAQ is related somewhat to both cloud computing and EHR contracts, which we'll uh, address in a little bit because sometimes vendors would hold PHI hostage or refuse to put transition language in an agreement or say, we'll destroy it immediately, or if you don't pay, you don't get access to your stuff. Um, all of that is not okay. Um, the PHI has to be returned or destroyed when the business associate agreement terminates. Um, OCR does note that if the covered entity has agreed to terms in a business associate agreement that prevent the covered entity from ensuring the availability of its own PHI, it's the covered entity that's not in compliance with HIPAA. So that's another reminder to pay attention to what's in those documents and to get rid of uh, language that does not work. Um, they did, OCR published, or sorry, ONC published guidance on September of 2016. Uh, ONC is the Office of the National Coordinator for, Hi for Health Information Technology. And um, OCR and ONC have lots of interaction and overlap. So in this guidance, they talk about selecting an EHR vendor and negotiating those EHR contracts. Um, the document itself is uh, titled EHR Contracts Untangled, um, and the document itself includes some sample contract terms. It's kind of a long document. It's 56 pages, so kind of roughly the same length as uh, some of the software contracts that we see. Um, and I think the guidance is actually pretty helpful. Um, they talk about how core service and performance obligations should be spelled out clearly. Um, they recommend picking a vendor who's going to be willing to incorporate language that says who's responsible for information security. Um, usually the vendors try pretty hard to say we're not responsible for anything. And sometimes a choice of vendor is sort of an illusion because sometimes there are uh, vendors that are really the only player in a market that offers a certain capability that a covered entity needs. So this can be tough, but um, it is important to try and work with a vendor who is going to 
be somewhat reasonable about the language and what they're going to agree to or not agree to. Um, the guidance also says to try and get warranties and other guarantees. That can also be extremely difficult, but it's worth fighting with them over that. Um, again, I think they do provide some helpful advice in that guidance and generally good suggested terms for the contract. But keep in mind, it won't always be possible to negotiate those terms into the contract. Um, and so it's a matter of getting the contract in as good a shape as you can. Uh, OCR also published a new FAQ and a clarification regarding access to PHI and charging fees to patients for records. And I have clarification in quotes here because I think they did more than clarify. I think they actually made a little bit of new uh, regulation on this. Uh, but in general, um, according to HIPAA, individuals have a right to access their own PHI. The clarification was that individuals could direct a third party to have access to that individual's PHI without having the individual sign an authorization. Um, if somebody wants to do that, what they, should, what they are supposed to do is make a request for access by the third party and do it in writing and have it signed and clearly identify who is going to get the information. So I could write out a piece of paper that says, I, Briar Andreessen, would like for you to send my medical records to Marguerite Amon, sign it, and it, that counts. That is my access of information being directed to a third person. Um, when you are giving somebody access to PHI, you have to provide the information in the form and format requested by them if it's readily producible in that format. Um, or you can give them a readable hard copy or some other format as otherwise agreed with the individual. Um, if it's on paper and the person wants it electronically, if it's readily producible, for example, if you can scan it, um, you must do it. OCR did say it, this isn't requiring anybody to buy a scanner, um, but if you have a scanner and can do this, you have to do it if the patient asks you to. Uh, you also have to be able to electronically, I'm sorry, there's a typo there, but you have to produce the information maintained electronically if you have it electronically. Um, they also note in this guidance that a 30-day response time is permitted, which it is under the regulations, but they make very clear that, that they think of that as an outer limit for when you have to provide the information. Um, if you have that requested PHI immediately available, you should get it to the individual quickly and much sooner than 30 days, particularly if you just need to click a button to have it emailed. Um, the fees for PHI, this is kind of a confusing area and we've gotten a lot of questions on it over the past several months. Um, what you're allowed to charge under HIPAA is a reasonable cost-based fee, but that fee can only include labor, supplies, and postage. Um, you're not allowed to charge any retrieval fees, not allowed to charge for any time spent searching for the records. The labor that you can charge for is only for the creating and delivering of the copies. You can also charge for the supplies that are used. Um, that includes paper and toner, um, a USB drive if you're giving it to them electronically. Um, you can't require somebody to purchase a USB though, uh, particularly if the information can be mailed or emailed to them. So uh, other fees that are authorized under state law are specifically not okay under HIPAA. So if a state law says you can charge X amount per page, but that is not, uh, that doesn't match up with the HIPAA reasonable cost-based fee, you cannot charge that amount per page. Uh, and OCR went so far as to say that covered entities should provide access free of charge. Um, I thought that was interesting because HIPAA does specifically allow you to charge um, but according to OCR, if you can provide it for free, you should do that. Um, charging patients who can't afford to pay is particularly problematic for OCR. So it, you should really consider waiving fees for in, indigent patients or for those uh, for whom paying would be a real problem. Um, but in general, you are allowed to charge. Uh, you can also charge for a summary of the PHI if the person asking for it agrees in advance to both the summary and the fee or whatever the summary is going to be. Uh, again, you can charge for the labor of photocopying or scanning. Um, they expect those labor costs to be small, so you would take somebody's hourly rate um, by the number of minutes that it would uh, take to do it, and that's what you could charge for. Um, you cannot charge anybody to view and download from a portal, uh, and you have to notify individuals in advance of the approximate cost for copies. Um, that can be difficult sometimes, and we'll talk a little bit about that. 
Uh, OCR also says that covered entities should post on their website or otherwise make available the approximate fee schedule for regular types of access requests. Um, and also, again, should, uh, should be in quotes because you don't have to uh, per the HIPAA regulations, but you should provide if a person requests it the breakdown of charges for labor, supplies, and postage that make up the total fee. I think that's asking a lot, but that is in the current guidance. Um, so there are three ways that you can charge your fees. Uh, you can use any of them uh, or a mix of them, but you have to keep patients informed ahead of time. Uh, you can charge the actual costs. Uh, you're still expected to tell the person the expected cost in advance. Uh, you can charge an average cost uh, where you have a schedule of costs for labor based on the average labor costs. Um, you can only charge the per page fee where the PHI is in paper form and the person asks for a copy though. Um, or you can charge a flat fee, which is a $6.50 maximum. Um, note that the fee limits apply to individuals when they are making their own requests for access um, or a request to request for access that they are then transferring to a third party. Um, the re requests by a third party based on a patient's authorization, the HIPAA specific authorization, are not subject to these fee limitations unless the third party is forwarding the patient's request. So I feel like the guidance has made it as confusing as they possibly could. Um, so in general, when you get a request for uh, access to information, including if it's, an, if it's based on an authorization, look carefully at it and try and figure out is the person requesting access or is something else going on. So moving on to our next uh, OCR guidance topic, we have the issue of HIPAA and ransomware. Uh, there have been thousands of daily ransomware attacks uh, in 2016, not all in the healthcare sector, but generally it's when a bad actor gains access to, uh, to a system, to technical infrastructure, usually via malware, to deny an organization access to its own data uh, by encrypting the data. Um, they demand some sort of payment, which is usually uh, requested in the form of Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. Um, and so the guidance from OCR describes prevention and recovery from a healthcare perspective. Um, they provided some guidance in a fact sheet, uh, which, is, uh, which is fairly helpful. What the main point of it is, is that when you are preparing for HIPAA, that can help you deal with this ransomware issue. Um, HIPAA requires all of these things, the security management process and risk analysis, implementing procedures, training your staff, uh, doing backups and making sure you can get the data from backups and having that contingency plan in place when something goes wrong. So uh, they also recommended having those backups offline or unavailable from the network uh, since this malware can sometimes disrupt online backups. Um, so they, they kind of go through the security incident procedures. Uh, they want you to prepare and respond to different types of security incidents, including ransomware. And they kind of, they go through some of the procedures for responding uh, to a randomware attack. I won't go through all of those here, um, but the, the guidance is pretty good on that. Um, they also talk a little bit about how to detect whether your systems are infected with ransomware and what to do if they're infected. Um, again, they refer to a NIST publication, the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide, um, and that is a pretty detailed and technical document, um, but also kind of helpful. Uh, there's also the question of, is it a breach if you have ransomware that affects your system? And it depends. It's a fact-specific analysis. Um, but OCR has said, if the EPHI is encrypted by this uh, bad actor as a result of an attack, they say it is a breach. Um, I again think that might be going a little far uh, because it's not clear to me that the PHI has been compromised in that case, uh, in that Possibly nobody has accessed it, but it's, it's worth it to review. Um, their next bit of guidance was about allowing film crews into your facility. Um, this was both a frequently asked question and a settlement with OCR. So generally the answer is no, don't. Uh, don't allow anybody to film on premises. Um, the, the settlement that happened was a New York hospital that, uh, that paid a major settlement for allowing what OCR called unfettered access to treatment areas of the hospital without authorization. Um, the, according to the guidance, if there is going to be a film crew somewhere where there is PHI visible, you have to have patient sign an authorization to do it. Um, 
that seems pretty common sense, but uh, we have had clients where uh, film crews have asked to come into the ER because it's very exciting and bloody. And in most cases, patients were very willing to sign whatever, and this was before HIPAA actually, but they were very willing to sign anything that they had to so that they could get on TV. So um, people might want to, and if they really want to, you can allow them to do it, but just make sure that you've got the right stuff in place to prevent problems. Does that even apply if the film cruise has Tom Cruise in it? David is back, <laughs> and I didn't even really understand that question, so I'm just going to move on to the OCR Cyber Awareness newsletters uh, that have come out. Um, these newsletters are out there on the OCR website. Uh, you can always go check on those. Um, there was one on reporting and monitoring cyber threats. Um, in that, they encouraged uh, reporting by the covered entity to um, the US, United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team um, and to monitor that website. Uh, again, that's not something that is specifically required, but OCR is encouraging you to do that. Um, they also note that uh, PHI can't be shared when you're reporting this if you report it to US CERT. Don't share PHI unless the disclosure is otherwise permitted under the privacy rule. Uh, there was also a newsletter on man-in-the-middle attacks um, and HTTPS inspection products. This just came out. It is, to me, fairly technical guidance, um, but the upshot of that was a third party can intercept and alter communications between two parties, and generally the two parties are unaware. Um, OCR talked about how using one of these HTTPS inspection products can actually cause more problems than it solves um, because it can uh, it can lead to your inspection product uh, not being able to validate a certificate properly. So this is something to discuss with your IT folks um, if you are using these uh, inspection products. Um, ONC, again, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, also issued a revised version of what they call their SAFER guides. And um, these guides are, they're nine guides for providers to use to assess and remediate their EHR vulnerabilities. Um, they first came out in 2014. Uh, there are three kind of uh, categories, foundational, infrastructure, and clinical process guides. And they really are a self-assessment where you answer questions about your implementation status of your system. Um, it gives you a recommended practices worksheet. Um, these are, I think that the safer guides are pretty good. Um, they are, they, OMC was very careful to note they're not to be used for legal compliance purposes, um, and implementing a recommended practice doesn't guarantee compliance. It's only informational. It's not intended to be used as an exhausted or definitive source. So take it all with a grain of salt, but these are a useful thing to pay attention to. Lots of recommendations there to get a team together to do the self-assessment. And I think it's pretty helpful to get people thinking about the issues um, and what systems are in place with your organization, how your organization deals with these issues. But note that these are not, even if you go through the whole self-assessment, the whole many hundreds of pages, it's not a risk assessment for HIPAA purposes. It is not a system, it's a systems review and not a determination of where your PHI is in the organization and how you're protecting that PHI. So. Um, for sure, go through the safer guides and take a look, but don't expect that to replace your um, required risk analysis. Um, this is just a list of what the safer guidelines include. Uh, they divide their um, guides into these nine categories, um, all of which, again, are, are fairly helpful and useful to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, here I'm showing you my pretty excellent Photoshop skills uh, to uh, let you know there is a new OCR boss, Roger Severino. He is quite new. Um, we don't know a lot about his priorities yet, but in the brief comments that I've heard, there's been no indication that there's going to be a major change in how OCR will operate. So kind of expect more of the same from them. Um, and speaking of them, they had a pretty active year for enforcement. They had 12 uh, settlement agreements and one civil monetary penalty, and we'll talk about those uh, the ones of, that are, I think, kind of illustrative. Um, AGs are also getting in on the HIPAA action. Um, for those of you in Massachusetts and Connecticut, you may be seeing more activity there. Um, the average settlement amount from OCR nearly doubled, uh, and OCR also noted that hacking is the cause of most of their large breaches. Uh, some of you are sadly aware that the HIPAA audits are happening now. Uh, 
OCR thinks of this as a toolbox of ensuring compliance. They have specifically said they're not doing these, audit, these uh, audits in pursuit of civil monetary penalties. Uh, and instead, they think of it as a free consultation uh, with feedback in the draft report. Um, they did note, though, that you can move from an audit to a compliance review, which is when you get in trouble, if you don't respond to their inquiries or if you send documents, as they said, that make it look like you have no idea what you're doing. So uh, when you send them stuff, and you should send them stuff if they're asking for it, uh, try to make it uh, appear that you, that you have paid attention and that you are taking reasonable steps. Um, currently, they're in phase two of the audit program, so they're doing these desk audits, and they have said they're not sure if on-site audits are going to be coming before the end of 2017 or not. A um, couple things we have learned in the HIPAA audits. Um, I think they are maybe finding fault where there is perhaps no actual fault under uh, what HIPAA truly requires. Uh, for example, they have dinged a few people for not having their notice prominent enough on the organization website uh, and said that down at the bottom of the page is not good enough. So you have to have it more prominent than that, and I'm not exactly sure where that should be, but it's something that they've found. Um, also, they want to have contact information for your business associates, um, including emails and phone numbers, which I think most business associate agreements do not have um, and are not required to have. Um, HIPAA enforcement investigations and compliance reviews are complaint driven. Um, they can come in through breach reports, news reports, or information from other agencies. So yes, they do talk to each other. They're looking for egregious behavior when they do these settlement corrective actions. Um, insider threats have become a big deal uh, and timeliness of breach notification is a new one. Um, we did see a recent settlement with UMass. They paid $650,000 and they would have had to pay more except they're in terrible financial shape apparently. Uh, so that was specifically noted by OCR as a mitigating factor for them. Um, that was a malware situation and a failure of a hybrid entity to have appropriate firewalls in place and the uh, standard that they had an insufficient risk analysis. Um, a major settlement was a five and a half million dollars for a system in Florida. Um, that was uh, one that had quite a few individuals, over 100,000. Um, they didn't implement procedures terminating a user's right of access. So a former employee was able to go back for, I think it was a year, and access PHI. So that is, in fact, a big problem. Um, also, they didn't regularly review their information system activity, even though it had been identified on a risk analysis. So the lesson learned from that is if you find something, then you need to fix it. Um, there was also a first settlement for a failure to timely report a breach. Um, it was a smaller amount, but um, for something that was really a fairly minor infraction. Uh, they discovered the breach on October 22nd. They didn't report it until January 31st. Um, the problem was that it affected more than 800 individuals. So this is a reminder that if a breach affects 500 or more people, you have to report within 60 days of discovery. Um, if it's fewer than 500 people, you have to report to OCR on an annual basis within 60 days of the end of the calendar year. So prior in the, in the Medicare 60-day report and return rules, the 60 days doesn't start to run till you've quantified the amount of money, right? So you get this time to investigate. In the breach context, if the breach happens January 1st and it takes you a long time to figure out who's involved, do you have to report within 60 days of the breach or do you get like a lot of time to figure out what's going no, on? No, you've got 60 days from the date of discovery of the breach. So if you're really, I would argue, if you have to take a little while to figure out if it was actually a breach or not, um, then maybe you've got a little extra time. But really think of that 60 days as a pretty hard deadline once you know that something has gone wrong. You can always update OCR later with additional information. Um, I have used two exclamation points on this slide because there was a civil monetary penalty for HIPAA, and that hardly ever happens. I think there has only been one other one in the history of HIPAA, and that was a bizarre outlier. Um, this one was much more of a run-of-the-mill case, um, and it didn't even go to an ALJ before that uh, CMP was imposed. Um, OCR said there was a failure to timely request a hearing, um, but the fine itself was due to a kind of standard issue, impermissible disclosure of EPHI and sort of what they say is non-compliance over many years, which I think in general means they didn't do all that they could have. Um, it was a self-report of a lost, unencrypted BlackBerry in 2009. So, um, you know, 
it was surprising that they had a civil monetary penalty. I believe it was in the range of $3 million. Um, so that, that was a big and unusual deal. Um, OCR has said there will be more to come from them on sharing information with caregivers and family members. And a big part of that is from the 21st Century Cures Act, where HHS is required to clarify when HIPAA allows communications with caregivers. Um, this won't change the law or regulations. So the caregivers, or 21st Century Cures Act just says HHS has to explain the existing rules, um, which I think are not that confusing. Um, but they may be, a, this guidance that will be to come may be a little more expansive. Um, OCR has said that cybersecurity and cyber threats remain a big deal and a focus for them. They are very proud of their guidance on ransomware, so should you get in trouble with OCR, don't criticize that. Um, they note that you should hire a person who knows about security issues, um, whether that is uh, an in-house person that you hire specifically for that, or beef up your team, or hire a outside consultant. Any of that is fine, but you have to have somebody uh, working for you that knows about security. Um, continuing focus on risk analysis, please make sure you do these and figure out where PHI is in your system, where ePHI is, um, and how you're going to protect it in all of its many locations. Uh, they also have said, OCR has said, that mobile devices remain a focus and a problem for them, and that those are often not being appropriately secured. Um, one other note here, and this is, this is fact of the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act, um, which is just a reminder that it's not always just the healthcare laws that you need to pay attention to. Um, the fact that was in the news recently because Subway just settled for $30.9 million. Um, this is close to my heart because I am a former sandwich artist. Um, but the, what they did wrong was having a full expiration date of debit cards printed out on their receipts. Um, they also had the last four digits of the uh, debit card number. Uh, FACTA doesn't allow you to do that. So this was a class action. Um, I think the people whose information was printed out got $7.69. Um, and the lawyers, it's a lot. The lawyers raked in probably about $10 million and Subway had to pay uh, $31 million. So, um, you know, if you're printing out expiration dates from credit cards, stop doing that and figure out a way to fix your system. Um, but in general, kind of pay attention to these uh, big settlements from businesses that, uh, that like you, have customers and uh, transact a lot of sensitive information. So final notes on, uh, on what can you do. Uh, and again, it's really doing as much as you can. The risk analysis, do it update it regularly, check back on it. When something changes in your environment, update your security risk analysis. Um, when something bad happens, update your risk analysis. And if you've noted, if you've found a problem in your risk analysis where you've got a gap, um, address that in the risk analysis and say, we're gonna fix this by, and then give yourself a timeline that's not totally open-ended and then actually uh, get it done by that timeline because failure to do any of those can get you in trouble with OCR. Um, document what you've done, uh, including little tiny things that you've done, like sending reminder emails, uh, updating passwords, anything that you can do to build your records for risk analysis. Um, but also when you provide training, when you're doing breach reporting, or when you're not reporting a potential problem because you've decided it's not a breach, keep that documentation so that you're able to tell a story to OCR if they come asking. Uh, when something does go wrong, make sure you address it as quickly and thoroughly as you can. Uh, respond to it and remediate it. Um, and then bring in experts when you need to. So in general, you want to use a multidisciplinary team to deal with privacy and security issues. Um, getting clinicians on board, getting compliance there, uh, privacy staff, IT, sometimes lawyers. Um, and be careful with your vendors. Make sure you've got business associate agreements in place. Uh, make sure your vendors know what they're doing and make sure that you are on top of those agreements with the vendors. Um, that's it for me. Uh, feel free to send your questions and then David's going to pop in here. So yeah, so a, a couple of quick things before we go for questions and you got a chance to, to send them now. First, I think you can see why I feel ridiculously lucky to have colleagues like Briar and Margie. Um, it's interesting. I want to focus on something Briar said to start us off, which is she said, you know, the OCR thinks you've never done enough. And that's true, and it's really frustrating. And when you get into one of these fights, your challenge is kind of to convince the OCR that really you're not a bad egg. 
And I have watched Breyer and Katie Hilton spend time, you know, really work on trying to get the OCR to understand what you've done. It's interesting. There are different strategies to how to approach a dispute. You know, some people are going to pound on the table. And when it's both in the privacy context and in these fights over provider-based things, in my experience, that does not get you very far. You have to use sort of a polite, friendly, humorous, deferential approach if you want to move the government. And Breyer's masterful at that. And so it's really cool to see that in action. I know she and, and Katie have worked on a couple of things and they've moved the government. Um, and so I just sort of want to emphasize that, that that's an important uh, it's an important part of this. Uh, also, I know I've learned a lot from a couple of my, Breyer will look at um, uh, agreements with vendors, as do Ann Ladd, Steve Helland, and Carrie Rosenberry, and they find stuff that I know nothing about and that can cost you a boatload of money. Um, so I just want to mention that because I think the OCR world is a frustrating one. I think people are frustrated a lot because there are often big fines for fairly common minor mistakes. So we got at least one question I know. Um, Margarita, you, have you got that handy? Yep, yep. So this was from the part two um, part of the uh, presentation today, and it's a great question. So does the mere referral of a patient for substance abuse treatment trigger the application of the new rules uh, to the referring provider such that they would be subject to part two? Um, so, and I see exactly uh, why someone would think that because the term referral uh, is used when defining a part two program. Um, but thankfully, the answer to that question is no. Um, you must hold yourself out as referring for treatment purposes. So just providing um, periodic advice for substance abuse, abuse treatment or um, periodic referrals uh, unless you um, fall under that definition of holding yourself out as referring for treatment, um, you would not be subject to the Part 2 uh, regulations. Thanks. Uh, we all have a couple other questions, too. Uh, when lawyers are requesting patient records, can they be charged? Um, that is probably a fact-specific response. In general, now attorneys have caught on to the uh, patients can request access. So most of the time now, um, when we're seeing attorney requests, it is uh, just based on this patient is requesting access be provided to me. Uh, and in most cases, uh, you can only charge that limited amount. Um, if they are going with an authorization, so they, uh, a person has signed an authorization that allows the attorney to access, or to, to get the records through that authorization, then you wouldn't be subject to the limitations in, um, in HIPAA. You could charge whatever you wanted, the per page fee. Uh, sometimes attorneys will fight back about that and sometimes not. Um, so the answer is it depends on how the attorney's framing the question, unfortunately. Um, another question, uh, did OCR specifically say a footer on a homepage with a link to the notice of privacy practices is insufficient? Yes, they did. Um, in at least a couple of the audits that I am aware of. Um, that caused a lot of consternation among the people listening to the OCRs, people speaking about this, because nowhere in, uh, in HIPAA it does that, is that a requirement, nothing that specific. What's, what HIPAA says is you have to prominently, uh, you have to feature it prominently on your website. So it's probably a good idea if you're going to have it kind of in the footer area, that you call it out um, in, the, you know, in a bigger font or something, and that it specifically say notice of privacy practices, not that it is um, buried in kind of the privacy practices section of the website or something else about that a patient wouldn't know what they're what they're getting to. Um, we've got a, a question here from someone who's like, "Hey, can we, our business associate agreement? We want to make sure it has the correct language. Can you guide me on that?" And I couldn't, but Marguerite and Breyer most certainly could. And we'll, we can follow up with you offline um, uh, on that. I, I will note, you know, obviously, I, I sit here and listen to Marguerite go through the stuff at the beginning. And I didn't know that, there, you know, I, there was a government agency I didn't know existed until listening to Marguerite. So it's, it is nice to have experts here who can help us through this stuff. Um, I think, do we have one more question, Breyer? Are we, are um, I, I, we do. I want to say on the business associate thing, there is also a, there's a template business associate uh, agreement language that the government puts out, which you can use. Um, we also kind of have a standard template that we recommend. 
our standard template has an indemnification provision in it, which I think you definitely should have. Um, and the government's does not because it's not required by HIPAA, but it's a it's a good idea to try and protect yourself. And I'm just going to chime in and just say, people sometimes forget, like us lawyer types, when we're doing work with a client, we need to have a BAA with you. Right. Um, and, you know, we use our own form for that. But I think things like that get lost a lot. Yeah. And I'd be happy to, uh, to shoot you a, a copy of our standard document. Um, one other question, uh, any specific guidelines to follow in providing clinical information to workers' compensation? Um, that is a good question. Uh, workers' comp is separated out from HIPAA's requirements, so basically you need to look to state law to say what you're allowed to send um, and to whom you're allowed to send it, and in most cases that is broader than HIPAA. Um, this particular question noted that there are different companies from all over the country demanding uh, clinical info and unsure of if they have a right to do that. So it's it's probably necessary to review the state law wherever you are. Uh, and the patient generally doesn't need to provide written consent for those disclosures. But again, that varies from state to state. All right. So next, our next webinar on May 10th. Will My birthday. Be, is, I, I didn't realize that. Indeed. Uh, that's why we're having a May 10th prior. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's about physician compensation. So I will be doing that one. Um, you should get an evaluation form right as you close out of this webinar. If you have a chance to fill it out, we always welcome that. And we love top new topics. Um, uh, we're looking for more topic ideas. You know, we've got June just right around the corner, and we've got a couple of ideas in the hopper, but we'd love to hear yours. And otherwise, thank you guys so much for signing in. Um, thank you, Marguerite and Breyer, for being way more confident than I am. And uh, uh, have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.